if you're new to our church or new to Christianity in general, uh, that particular image of the, the choir singing um, is not just talking about like at a dinner table, kitchen table, something like that, for maybe for a meal, but we're talking about the table of communion. Um, we have a small table up here, uh, kind of an altar table where we have the communion elements that uh, the bread, the, the juice was we eat and we drink together. You'll just have little, little samples uh, that we receive, which in Christian theology represents the fact that Jesus gave his life for you and for me. doesn't matter what you've done, where you're from, what your language is or whatever. Um, it's one Jesus, one Holy Spirit then of God that's offered to us, one forgiveness, and then one love for one another that we as, as the church universal, you know, people all around the world that, that receive Holy Communion, um, we're all doing it for that same purpose of remembering what Jesus did for us celebrating it, joining together, and believing that the Holy Spirit in some way, shape, or form connects us with God and with each other into one big happy family. Um, so here we are, one big happy family. Um, my birthday's coming up, so I, I know you want to know ideas for me, since you're my family members, and uh, Christmas, no, I mean that's, no, we don't do that, but at the same time you get the idea, like one family, all together, and we have brothers and sisters that speak uh, Ukrainian and Spanish and Portuguese and all these different languages all around the world. That when we were a part of a really big family, and God's got kind of joining us together. Now, what should we expect from a church? Well, that's what I'm going to be talking about today. But this is a, it's kind of a cool thing to think about. Like if if we're to gather with our family members that love Jesus, and we're all one big happy family, what do we expect when we gather? You know, um, no joke. My, my youngest son was talking to one of his friends that doesn't really go to church, and my, my younger son, Simon, was saying, hey, do you guys go to church somewhere? And the other kid said something like, no, I don't need to go get bored. And some of you are like, I get it, I get it, right? You know, you know maybe you grew up in church, and it was like, ah, oh, so boring. What do you expect out of a church? What do you expect out of a, of a gathering of people? When you come here, you expect pretty cool music, Right? Did we live up to your expectations today? I'm glad to hear that. If not, we'd have to redo it, right? No, but we did. You know, you expect certain things. I hope you don't expect to come in and get, be bored, uh, you know, but, but different stylistic things are exciting or boring to different people, and so we try to have different styles. But man, when we're talking about the Holy Spirit of God doing something in our hearts and our lives, uh, I mean, that's exciting. It's pretty crazy. I mean, when I see somebody forgive somebody else for something that that other person doesn't really deserve forgiveness. I mean, they were wrong, and they did it, and they were intentional. But this other person receives um, peace inside and, and forgives them. I mean, for me, like, I, that makes me excited. I'm like, oh, my gosh, man, that's, that's crazy exciting. Or when I see family members start to, to work better together, when it's more common for family members to have strife and to kind of fight and stuff, um, not that any of us do it perfectly, but when it gets better, I'm like, man, that is really amazing. Or when I see people help each other, and sometimes even on Sundays, I'll see people kind of help one another in different ways. You know, whether it's parking a car, or helping somebody in, carrying something for somebody, or even, you know, talking through, you know, different things. I'm like, that's exciting. That's exciting. So what do we expect from church? Well, I'm diving into this, and this is the very last sermon in a series of sermons where we've been talking about expectations. Because if we have really high expectations and then they never get met, then we're mad and upset all the time. But if we have really low expectations of different people and things and God and the Bible and church, um, then we may never live up to our full potential. So where is, where is it that God lands when God gives the expectations for what, what church is and what churches are like and what church people are like? Well, let me first try to figure out the definition for a church because if you consider the definition of a church to being a building, then we're not even on the same page. And yet I did a Bing church, a search. You know, I didn't Google it, I Binged it. I don't know why. But nonetheless, I did that and I said, you know, church, what is the church? And the first thing that came up on the computer was a building where Christians worship. And I was like, Argh! And I wanted to call up Microsoft and say, Get this right, because that is wrong. Maybe that's a second or third definition for a church, that it's a building. But we know, no, 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 the Bible and Christians have said for centuries, the church 
is not the steeple and the, the building. The church is the what? The people. That's exactly right. So I'm using a, a slide here that I used some weeks ago to just remind us that even though church, a lot of times we think building, church is the people. And then I wanted to draw some analogies because it's just to make sure we're all on the same page. What's, what's church? What's church? That word as it originated 2,000 years ago with followers of Jesus, they saw it as gatherings of people. Sometimes they gathered in homes. Sometimes they gathered in a synagogue building. Later on, they built buildings that they called church buildings. But it was always the people gathering together, focused on Jesus, loving Jesus, following him, and that's how they were then experiencing direct communication with God and being God's family. Some analogies would be a school, a gym, and a hospital. Let's talk about those for a second. Let's put, the, let's put the school way over here, okay? Church is like a school. A school is a place where kids go with eager anticipation that they're going to get to learn. And they're all excited to go to school. And they wake up in the morning, oh, I can't believe I get to go. And then they go into the classroom and they bow down at the feet of the teacher Oh, mighty teacher, thank you and bless you for teaching me today, right? Yeah, that's, uh, you know, that <laughs> I know a lot of us struggle, right? You know, now, teachers will tell you as well, in the classroom, certain kids, they're getting it, they're excited, they're engaged, they ask questions, and, and they really do want to learn. They do want to learn, it's cool. And others, ah, uh, they're just there because their parents made them. And others are there, you know, just because there's nothing else to do. They're just kind of... Com- now, the church is like that, right? We don't, at the doors, check the holiness level of people and say, you're not holy enough to get in here and stay away. Oh, you're really holy and loving and you really love Jesus, so come on in. We don't do that, do we? How many of you would make it in here if we did? <laughs> you know, um, all of you, I know, but you know, me too. You'd be like, wow, come on in. No, we don't do that. But that means then that it is a little bit like a school. Some people are going to really want Jesus and are going to be trying to love Jesus, and some of them are going to be 100% sold out. I want to love Jesus. I want to love people. I want to do that. Others are there because mom made them, <laughs> right? Or, you know, this, or others are just kind of doing it because that's just what they always did, but they haven't really connected with this whole relationship with God through Jesus, empowerment of the Holy Spirit coming within them. They're just not there yet. And so that's, that's what church is like when we gather as God's people, but we don't kick people out in a way that aren't there yet fully. That's going to come into play here in a minute. Okay, let's talk about a hospital. When you go to a hospital, the level of expertise of every doctor, is it all the same high, perfect level, or are some doctors a little better than others at what they're doing? Some are a little better than others, right? The doctor that graduated from medical school at the last of his or her class is still called. The surgeon that just messed up three surgeries in a row is still called a a doctor, a surgeon, you know. I mean, you know, so when you go into the hospital, some things are going great. Some people are really doing what they ought to be doing, and some are kind of messing it up. Some are just there because mom made them, right? I mean, you've got all these, but... You're focused on getting well. That's the singular focus. School, you're focused on education. Maybe not everybody's at the same level in seriousness and stuff, but yet you're you're trying. Hospital trying to get well physically. Workout gym, you know, when you walk into Planet Fitness or the Prairie Township Rec Center or something like that, and you walk in, you can usually tell what people are really serious about their physical fitness working out, right? They've got little journals. They've got the jug of water, right? They've got the special clothing and stuff. They're, they're there at a certain time each day, and they're really working out and stuff. You know, the other person, you know, they're walking in eating a donut, <laughs> right? <laughs> Do a couple of things, and then they, you know, whatever. And it's like, wait, you know, and... But, you know, people that work there, tell, you know, they'll tell you, yeah, we get the whole gamut, you know. In January, everybody's coming out, you know, six months later, you've only got the serious folks, right? You know, we get that. But you're focused on getting stronger, you're focused on getting healthier, that kind of thing. When we come into a church, 
we have all of these different things going on in terms of levels of interest, levels of seriousness and dedication. And it's a beautiful thing because God has created us in such a way that we can meet together with a singular focus to get to know God and love God and love people. But yet, we don't just like get exclusive and say, no, you're not doing it good enough yet. I don't want you here sitting. No, come on in. Give it a try. Figure it out. We'll, we'll, try, to, we'll try to work together to do that. So if we were then to say, okay, what could we reasonably expect from church gatherings of people? I would give you two different things. I'd say you could expect there to be love and you could expect there to be messiness. You're with me? Okay, so we got love, Jesus himself, Matthew twenty two thirty six. 36. <laughs> Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? 2,000 years ago, asking Jesus, Son of God, which is the greatest commandment in the law, the Old Testament? And Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, strength, everything. Love God, right? And then a little later he said, the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. In another part of the Bible, it says God is love. So as we love God, and then God's love fills us, then we love each other. Totally, 100%. Or at least 99%. That's still an A, right? I mean, you know, we're getting there. We're getting there. So as we're loving, Jesus himself and John chapter 13, John's writing about what Jesus said and did. He writes down that Jesus said, A new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another. Now we have those words in our Bible and we read those. We talk about them. We sing about them. When we experience Holy Communion, we have the bread, we have the cup, and the cup is some version of grape juice or wine, depending on the religious tradition that you come from, but it's all that same kind of red color to represent the blood of Christ and the body of Christ. We have the Bible that talks about the words of Jesus and what he did and, and God's interaction with humanity. We have crosses representing that Jesus died for us. All expressions that God is reaching out to us, not standing off saying, good luck, I send you to earth, but you're on your own. Just try to love each other. It's not the way God is. God reaches out. God speaks to people people write and then write down what did they hear from God or what did they think they were understanding from God Jesus comes as the representation of God in human form and dies for humanity that's interesting didn't come with a ruler and smack all of our hands (laughs) shape up shape up shape up no no no. he said no wait let me show you what it's supposed to look like to care about people if you even want to kill me it's if it's going to be for your good I'm going to do it and that's a challenge because that means that for me If Columbia Heights would be better off and would be well served to love God by me getting nailed to a cross, then I have to be willing to say, I'd do it. Please don't make that a reality, right? (laughs) You know, I'm not asking you to do that. But there's a lot on the line when I say, I love Jesus and I want to follow Jesus. That's on the line. And the vice versa is also true. If God said to you, look, if you'll die on a cross for those people, It will really help them and save them from sin or destruction, family deterioration. If you just die on a cross for them, they would be better off. If you love Jesus, that's part of what he was saying. Take up your cross and follow me. It's you you then saying, okay, if it was better for my family for that to happen, I would do it, Lord. Whatever you need. You need me to give up stuff or you need me to take on stuff or you need me to do this or that, I'm in. I will help those people no matter what it takes. That's crazy. It's amazing. But when we have crosses... That's what it reminds us of. So love, when people visit our congregation, which is just one little part of the overall world church, and they expect that there would be at least some people that would love them and be nice to them, that's a, that's a fair expectation, right? It's not fair to expect that everybody would be like that because remember we're like a hospital or a gym or a, a school. W- you know, we're, we're not saying you've got to be absolutely loving and perfect to come here. If you're on the road and in process, or even if you're just checking it out, you're welcome here. So you might come and and interact with three people on church property, none of whom treated you rightly. That could happen. Why? 
because those three people might be in process trying to know God and be forgiven, and they may not be all in yet, right? But then that fourth and fifth person, you might be like, that was like some of the nicest experiences I've ever had. Those are some of the nicest people I've ever had. Do we have some of the nicest people in the world in this room right now? Do we have that? Yeah, we do. Like, no joke. It's pretty cool. So it's fair then to expect there to be love. And as we measure how loving and caring and compassionate are we up here or down here, it should be growing and we we, we should be developing that. But it's messy as well. It's messy. Should we expect church to be messy? Yeah. You, know, you want to know how I know that? Because that perfect guy that died on a cross for everybody and was perfectly loving, his followers, when we read that about them in the New Testament, his followers made some mistakes sometimes. At one point, here they are, students of the most holy, loving guy ever, and the students are arguing about who's more important. <laughs> You know, it's in the Bible. And Jesus is like, wait a second. You guys are arguing over who's more important? <laughs> like, I want you to serve each other. I'll tell you who's the most important. It's the one that's serving the others the most and, and is just saying, you know what? It's all about you guys. Let me, let me just help you. That's, that's the most important one. That's the best one. It's like backwards, right? His, his followers at one point, they said, um, Jesus, those folks over in that town are rejecting you. Do you want us to call down fire from heaven and destroy it? <laughs> what, what did Jesus say? No. <laughs> no, I don't want that. I'm going to die for those people. I'm trying to have them forgiven and saved. Right? So Jesus' own followers had messy problems. After the resurrection and uh, the giving of the Holy Spirit, things got a little better. They got, they got their act together to an extent. But then when you read the, the book of 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians, that's written by Paul, one of the most dedicated followers of Jesus ever. He writes back to a church that he planted. He started it. He babied them, and he taught them, and he showed them how to love Jesus. Then he went away, and things went crazy. And so in 1 Corinthians, we find out that when the first Christians were gathering at, like, literal tables, and they had their bread, and they had wine, and it was real wine, how do we know? Because Paul says, some of you are getting drunk at communion. What are you doing? That's stupid. And they're like, yeah, but we're happy. You know, it's like, this is ridiculous. And it was even, even more disgusting. Some of them had lots of money. They had plenty of food. Then they would come. They would like share with each other their food. But there are others at the table that were going away hungry because they didn't have enough. And again, Paul, the Christian leader, who's writing to these church people was like, that's stupid. Now, he doesn't say the word stupid, but it comes close. That's crazy. Share. Like, those folks aren't just there, like, trying to take advantage of you. They're there because they're finding hope in Jesus. It's the same Jesus that died for you. The, the person has a, enough and even a little more. Share with them your little more, you know? It's crazy, amazing expressions of love. But it was messy. And if it was messy for the people Jesus was leading and it was messy for the people Paul was leading, it's going to be messy for the people that you and I lead. Because it's going to be tough. Because you have imperfect people and a holy, perfect God, and God's interacting with these imperfect people, and sometimes the perfection of love shines through, and other times the imperfectness shines through. One of our life groups recently, as we were talking, and we said, does everybody need Jesus? And a brilliant statement was made, I wish I would have thought of it. And the statement was, yes, everybody needs Jesus because nobody's perfect. Hmm. Doesn't matter whether you're Christian or some other religion or whatever. We all need forgiveness of God because nobody's perfect. When you come into a church gathering, not one person there is perfect. Even the nicest person that you've known for years, they're going to have some bad days sometimes. It's going to be a little messy. But what we will see again and again and again is expressions of great love and forgiveness again and again and again. It's part of why every Sunday we pray in the Lord's Prayer, forgive us our sins, our trespasses, our debts, depending on what church tradition you come to. Forgive us our trespasses, our sins, our debts, as we forgive those who forgive, who sin against us, trespass against us. Forgive us, Lord. We're people of great love. 
That means that we're people of great forgiveness and repentance. We're always asking for forgiveness. But love means you never have to say you're sorry. Bull, <laughs> right? <laughs> That's ridiculous. Love means you're always saying, I'm sorry if I've offended you. I'm sorry that I've, and not just am I uh, sorry. I don't want to do that anymore. I don't want to hurt you. I want to change. I want to want to keep going. But it's a messy process, right? So here we go. Now, as we start thinking about ourselves, we're going to prepare our hearts for Holy Communion in just a second. As we think about our church then, our church is perfectly loving and perfectly messy at the same time. Perfectly. And that's beautiful. If you go to a gathering of people where it looks like everybody gets along, nobody argues or complains, there is no dirt on anybody, they all follow the leader and whatever he or she says perfectly, what have you got? I would say you've got a cult and you better run the other way, <laughs> right? Because they're faking it. There is no way that it's all good and perfect like that. How do I know? Pick up your Bible, read about how the early Christians lived. Sometimes they got it perfectly right, and other times they got it perfectly wrong. It was messy, and, we, and it's true in the Bible. It doesn't whitewash it and say, you know, everything all the time was absolutely always perfect. No, 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 we've got letters back saying, whoa, don't do this. Why are you doing this? What's going on with this? And so we're real here, but in the midst of the messiness, I see again and again and again, encouragement of one another. I see forgiveness of one another. I see people turning back to God. I see people searching after God and they're like, you know what, I'm not even sure I want to receive Holy Communion yet because I'm not sure I believe it all yet, but I'm at least interested and I'm going to keep, keep seeking. And that's beautiful. And we keep, we keep turning back to God. And I want to even do that in just a second all together. Okay? But I, I admit it's messy, but we're going to overcome and we're going to be victorious. In Revelation chapter 2, verse 7, we read these words. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the what? Okay, good idea, right? God's Spirit is saying something to the churches. In this place, here's what the Spirit says. To the one who is victorious, I will give them the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Paradise of God is this vision of eternity with God. Paradise, wonderful, loving tree of life, the image that somehow we are receiving from God, eternal life. Beautiful, whole, joyful, happy, we're receiving that. In order to receive that, we have to be victorious. Some Bibles say conquer. They translate it conquer or victorious. In order to be victorious or to conquer, you have to have a what? A battle, right? A conflict. We are in the midst of a battle, a conflict. And it's a messy battle and a messy conflict between us with God and us with evil and Satan, right? And so we battle Satan, we battle temptations, and to those that are victorious that say, God, help me, and I'm going to follow you, Jesus, and I'm going to keep fighting that battle to be victorious. To those that are victorious, they're given eternal life in paradise. That's beautiful. That's awesome. You're making it. You're going to struggle, and you're going to be victorious, that's where we're headed. In the midst of that battle, Jesus says in John 13, come back to that again, a new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you, love one another. That is our battle. God says, okay, here are the orders. Sir, yes, sir, what are my orders? Your orders are go love one another like Jesus loves them. But sir, how am I going to do that? What kind of weapons are you going to give me? Well, I'll tell you what. I'm going to give you written words that are going to help you to know me and to help you to do that. I'm going to give you physical things to do, like receive Holy Communion, to always kind of re-enlist and re-up your commitment to Jesus. And I'm going to give you the Holy Spirit to help you from the inside out to give you strength and love and forgiveness. Is that enough? Well, sir, I'd also like a billion dollars. You don't need a billion dollars. The Holy Spirit's more valuable than that. It's more, more beautiful. So as we receive the Holy Spirit, the love of God, here's one little practice before we receive Holy Communion, okay? The practice is to try to love one another as Jesus loves them. It says in the Bible, the Holy Spirit of Jesus is interceding for you, praying for you right now. Let's practice that 
I want you, eyes wide open, I want you to look around and stare at the other people around you <laughs> in just a second. Cause it's, it's no big deal. You can handle it because you've been staring at me for like 20 minutes, all right? You can handle this, okay? But in just a second, I'm going to ask you to look at each other. And in your mind, I want you to pray, God, help them to be happy. Help them to be happy. Help them to be happy. Help her to be happy with the different people that you're seeing, okay? Now, this happiness is God's version of happiness, which is a holy joy deep within. It's peace that even when they're not getting what they think they want, they're still at peace and have joy. And that eternally, they're going to be able to have that connection with God that is way better than the material things that they may think that they want or the person they're trying to meet or something like that. All those are good, but the deep happiness of God is going to be even better than that they think that there is available. You know, So I'm going to be looking at you, but I want you not just to look at me, but each other too. And pray in your mind and heart, God, help them to be happy. Help them to be happy. Okay, ready? Right now. Here we go. Here we go. Okay. God, help them to be happy. God, help them to be happy. God, I want her happy. God, help her to be happy. God, help her to be happy. God, help her to be happy. God, help him to be happy. Jesus allowed his body to be broken for you and for me that we might be able to be whole with God as his spirit comes within us. Jesus allowed his blood to be shed on the cross that you might know how much God loves you and that you might know that you don't have to pay God off to be forgiven. You don't have to do hours and hours of penance for the rest of your life to be forgiven. He's already paid it. All you need to do is to receive that forgiveness and want to love him. God, our Father, would you bless these elements by your Holy Spirit and that as we eat and we drink, you, the one true God, would unite us with you by your Holy Spirit and unite us together as your family, one family, as we eat of this holy table. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.